Welcome to another edition of the Jerry Ratcliffe Show podcast, and it is my distinct pleasure today to join a, uh, to invite a familiar face, um, someone I have an utmost respect for and knows the ACC inside and out, um, and has for a long, long time, and uh, he gets around a little bit. So uh, without further ado, let me bring in Dave Glenn from... Uh, your chapelboro.com is your new gig, right, Dave? That's correct. Last few years, chapelboro.com. A lot of fun writing about the ACC and state of North Carolina stuff. Uh, but in, in our many couple decades, I guess, knowing each other, now I'm a little bit of a lot of things, Hootie. I'm a UNC Wilmington sports media professor. I'm getting back into my legal work. And of course, I share your passion for college sports and the ACC. So I'm kind of doing a little bit of everything at this stage of my life and career, and it's been a lot of fun. Keeps you hopping, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is true. Because, you know, like most of us, I'm also a husband and a dad and a pet owner and a son and a really excited to be at a stage of my life that I'm still doing uh, rather than letting the, you know, the career kind of be the tail that wags the dog. Yes, absolutely. It's more fun that way. <laughs> Amen. Um, let's dive right into it. Um, I guess we'll, we'll just get the, uh, the, the big Final Four stuff out of the way first because uh, it's coming up on us here in, this weekend with um, San Diego State and Florida Atlantic playing at 6 o'clock tomorrow night in one semifinal. UConn and Miami at 8.49 on, in the other semifinal and the championship Monday night at 9.20. Seems like it gets later every year, but uh, um, I can say that I'm overly excited about this Final Four, like, uh, other than the fact that <laughs> our good friend Jim Laranega is still kicking. Yeah, it's fun for the ACC to be involved, right? We've had three straight regular seasons where the ACC narrative during the regular season was most. The tournament. So the, the negative last year, it was different because Miami and Duke and Carolina all made the elite eight and Duke and Carolina, of course, played each other in the final four. And this year, the Hurricanes are kind of carrying that ACC banner. I share your admiration and respect for Jim Laranega. And beyond our enjoyment, given our roots in the ACC, uh, of seeing the Canes representing the league, there is a fun factor for me that three of the four Final Four teams are there for the first time in the history of those programs. That's true. So no matter how it shakes out, it's either UConn, which has been – basically a 21st century juggernaut, right? I mean, that's a multi, yes. you, you don't need to be old to remember UConn winning national titles, right? Uh, uh, they, so it, it's either going to be UConn adding another to their relatively recent collection, or it's going to be somebody cutting down the nets for the first time, and it might be those Miami Hurricanes. So I think we all as college basketball fans better buckle up for this kind of, unpredictability uh to me unpredictability is a positive word some people use instability which is more of a negative word <laughs> but whether you like or dislike name image like this you like or dislike immediately eligible transfers the result of such things is going to include cinderella having more of a chance and if florida atlantic cuts down the nets on monday night it will be the lowest seed in the history of a, a tournament that started in 1939 to win it all. And even the five seeds, Miami and San Diego State, I mean, 90% of NCAA tournaments have been won by top four seeds. So even Miami or San Diego State would be sort of the 10% rather than the 90%. Only UConn, which probably was underseeded given how good they were as a four seed, only UConn would sort of make it College basketball, same old, same old. Any of the other three cutting down the nets, I think is going to symbolize the fact that we're all living in a whole new world. 
You're exactly right, Dave. And um, I think it was about this time last year that I had Seth Greenberg on a podcast and he kind of threw out some caution as far back as then and said, uh, you know, and, and things were a little bit of a scramble at this time last year. And he said, uh, it's parody in college basketball. It, get ready for it. It's here. And um, I'm sure that NIL and Transfer Portal has ushered that in a little quicker than most people anticipated. But I, I think that is now the rule rather than the exception. Don't you, Dave? It, it, I, it, absolutely, it's here. I, I absolutely agree with you, Hootie. And one thing that's easy to forget is that the Miami Hurricanes – under that great coach, Jim Laranega, who you and I and everybody else has that admiration and absolute respect for. He is universally liked, universally respected. Under that same great coach, in 2019, they had a losing record. In 2020, they had a losing record. In 2021, they had a losing record. Three, I'll bet you if you and I were in Houston, standing on the sidewalks and asked, even some pretty serious college basketball fans who pay attention to this stuff, maybe even us in the media. I'll bet you, I'll bet you a majority of the media would get it wrong if you said, Hey, did you know that Jim Laranaga and the Canes have had three losing seasons in the last five years? They would all ask us what we were smoking. I think if we asked right. that question, right? Yeah. The reality yeah. is he had three bad years. And I'm not just saying losing record in the ACC. I mean losing overall records three years in a row, followed by 26 wins and an Elite Eight finish, followed by more wins and a, at least a Final Four finish, right? And a regular season first place share with uh, Virginia. I mean, <laughs> that doesn't make sense in, doesn't in make a normal sense. world, but maybe it does make sense in our new world. <laughs> And, uh, you know, at, at age 73, he's had to negotiate all the new stuff, and he may have done it better than anybody else. <laughs> I think you're right. And, and I don't even think that's just a casual throwaway comment, because if you think about it, you know, I've, obviously Isaiah Wong is, is sort of an old-fashioned player, right? Miami signed him out of high school, cultivated him when he wasn't quite as dominant a player. And now as an upperclassman, he was the ACC player of the year, right? That's kind of, you could write that script in 1950 or 60 or 70 or 80 or 90. But who are his, who are his other three best players? <laughs> Jordan Miller was all Atlantic 10 and George Mason, two, at George Mason two years ago. Right. Norchad O'Meer was the Sun Belt player of the year at Arkansas State. last year and Nigel Pell that's a pretty good league at, at Kansas State a year ago so whether you call it the transfer portal three of his four best players came that route whether you call it name image likeness Nigel Pack's deal is public information yeah. because he and he and the guy paying him made it public information two years eight hundred thousand dollars in name image likeness money that's a nice way to pick up a star point guard Certainly. So you're absolutely right. I don't know if he's the only one, but if we're giving out trophies for who has managed the transfer portal and name image likeness, well, if Jim Laranag is not the gold medal winner, he is somewhere on the podium, given what the Canes have done these last two years. You're exactly right. And uh, I know he's, he, I've known him for decades and he's a very young 73. Uh, I, I still don't know that I've ever seen anybody have as much fun uh, going to the Final Four as he did with George Mason back in, was that 06? That sounds right, yeah. Somewhere around there. And uh, I'm sure he's having just as much fun now in Houston. But uh, he, he's uh, he's quite an interesting character. And um, I, part, of the, part of me is surprised at the fact that he's been able to navigate the new waters like he has but but part of me shouldn't be because i know him so well and he's a smart dude he's uh, he still um uh, he still has conversations with bob rotella the famed uh international sports psychologist that lives here in charlottesville they forged 
a, a relationship back in the early 80s uh, when Bob was just getting started and Jim was figuring it out as an assistant under Terry Holland. And uh, they've maintained that relationship and developed it. And, and uh, I think Rotella has helped him come to grips with all the new stuff and, and everything else along the way. So uh, kudos to him for keeping an open mind and, and attacking <laughs> Uh, attacking everything on a uh, with with aggressive uh, attitudes, I guess. I agree. I mean, some of his qualities would work well in any walk of life, right? He's a smart guy. Yeah. He works hard, and he's incredibly likable. If you're those three things in any walk of life, you're at least giving yourself a chance, right? And then if you have some skill to go with it, and he was a respected X and O guy, dating back to his Terry Holland years at UVA, then one of the lowest seeds ever in the final four was that George Mason team. So, you know, he knows how to recruit. He knows how to develop. He knows how to coach. Um, he's just a smart guy. He knows X's and O's. He understands people and young men. I mean, he's not worried about anything but the final four right now, but it doesn't hurt if somebody, if some recruit out there is considering Miami, and on the one hand, they think, well, that guy's as old as my grandpa. You know, he's 73 years old. On the other hand, he's dancing better than I can. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that old, but I'm not a very good dancer. And he would tell us that he's not a great dancer either. So what? He's a 73-year-old man getting into the mosh pit with a bunch of 18 to 23-year-olds in the Miami locker room. And, he, and you can tell he's having fun, and he's a genuine man. He's authentic. It's not some show or some performance art. That's who he is. And, and I'm glad – I'm just – people ask us all the time as members of the media, you know, do you root for this school or against that school? I, I always tell them, and half of them don't believe me, but it's the truth, I root for people. Yeah. I couldn't care less what school – all the conspiracy theories, whether it's about me or somebody else in the media, oh, he hates that school or he loves that school. It's usually it's usually the accusation is, you know, that person thinks you hate his school and this other person thinks you hate her school. <laughs> I couldn't care less. Schools are a bunch of buildings and columns and, you know, they're, they're places, right? right. I, I find it weird. I mean, unless you have an emotional attachment, then I understand loving a place. But I grew up in Philadelphia. I, I didn't grow up in ACC country. I, I don't have any of that, you know, royal blue or Wolfpack red or Tar Heel blue in my childhood. Um, so I was plopped down in ACC country at about 20 years old. And my honest answer to that question has always been, well, if the coach is a nice man who comes on my radio show and uh, helps me with my column at accsports.com for 20 some years, I'm probably going to like him and I'm, I'm yeah. not going to be sad if his team wins. If some other coach is a jerk, I'm probably not going to be disappointed if, if he face plants. Right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, it's just the human element and, and the same school could have one coach that you do like and another coach that, that is not as likable. Oh yeah. You're not, you're not really rooting for or against the school and you're not really rooting at all. It's just being happy when good things happen to good people that's a human thing, and and we're allowed that as journalists, right? Uh, and Jim Laranega, of course, this is a great example of great things happening to a great person, uh, and those young men. A lot of those guys are really likable as well at Miami. Yeah, no question. Um, the rest of the ACC, Dave, uh, didn't fare so well in the in the tournament, and I guess it was a little bit of a surprise that we didn't have maybe a little bit more success, but um, it wasn't predicted. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Where do you think the ACC stands right now? Is it, um, is, is next year a year where it's going to have to do something to defend its reputation or last couple of years haven't been uh, so great, but last year was better than people thought it was going to be. The national right. people thought it was going to be. I don't think it surprised us at all, but. I think the bottom line is the ACC needs a good regular season, right? Because what they did a year ago with those three elite eight teams and two final four teams and Carolina coming so close to winning the national championship, you know, to me, 
your success or failure as a league starts with March Madness, right? I I mean, yeah. Theoretically, if you're a good coach, your team is playing its best, barring injuries, it's playing its best at the end because you've had them in practice for five months. And so, of course, your regular season reputation is built in large part on how many of those intersectional games you win or lose in November and December. And even though the ACC won the ACC Big Ten Challenge this past this current season, uh, it lost a lot more of the big games than it won. So, you know, UVA had a shot at Houston, but lost. And Duke had a shot at Kansas, but lost. And, and there were a lot of other similar examples. And so whether it's Ken Palm or some other n numerical system, or it's you or me or some national media member just speaking subjectively, it starts to shape the narrative in a negative way. I think I, I wrote an article. I think it was the ACC's record in the highest profile games against the highest profile opponents was three wins, non-conference, was three wins and 10 losses. Well, we now have three straight regular seasons with those kinds of themes. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the ACC saves its reputation by kicking tail last year in March Madness. Yeah. And by it, it's up and down, but Miami being in the final four, I think matters. All those other major conferences, Power Five as we call them, they're all home watching the ACC in the Final Four, right? Especially the so big it's it's really it's really more the regular season that has sagged a little bit. And and let's be real, some of the questions are fair questions because in our time knowing each other, there have been years where you and I would see each other at ACC Media Day, and our coaching guests would include. Already in the Hall of Fame, Rick Pitino, no longer at Louisville. Already in the Hall of Fame, Jim Beheim, no longer at Syracuse. Already in the Hall of Fame, Roy Williams, no longer at Carolina. Already in the Hall of Fame, Mike Krzyzewski, no longer at Duke. I mean, those guys are still associated with those schools. You know what I mean. Uh, they're no longer the head coaches of those schools. And when you lose four Hall of Famers in a stretch of years, and then you have three straight so-so regular seasons, there are going to be some questions. Um, my argument remains, if they've still had two good NCAA tournaments in the last three years, you can't really kick the ACC in the ribs too hard right. because nothing matter, matters more than winning in March and April. Um, if the regular season weirdness continues, there'll be more more questions about the ACC. But but I, to me, Hootie, in addition with coaches, it does come down to players. And I don't know if you vote on a lot of the national All-American teams. But I do. I don't okay, so that. you and I have probably both done it many, 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 many times. There have been years where you know you get 15 slots where I had to kind of check myself because I'm ready to write five different ACC names on those 15 slots in yes. many years. I'm talking 90s, early 2000s, even the second decade of this century. So the last couple of years, it's hard to keep all every year straight in my head. But for example, this year. I think I put 14 names down before I got to an ACC player. And and that means it's not just some, some kind of media created criticism, right? It's, it's right. of course, you're not going to win at the same high level when your Hall of Fame coaches leave or retire and you don't have as many lottery picks or college All-Americans, whatever measuring stick you want to use. You know, the best player in this league was somebody like an Isaiah Wong. Or somebody like, you know, Armando Baycott was first team all ACC. You could make an argument that neither of those guys were among the 15 best players in the country. Yeah. I mean, you know, they made various all Amer third team all America teams. And that's fine. I don't think it's crazy to think of them that way. But in recent years, I forget what year it was within the last half a dozen years, the ACC set the all time record. For most first round NBA draft picks in a year by a single conference. Well, <laughs> you know the league was loaded that year. Yes. Right? If you say it was doubled, there's only 30 picks in the first round, and the ACC, I think, had 11 of them. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy. Yes. Right? So you don't, have to, you don't have to wonder why the league was so stacked as care as duke's winning it all in 2015 and carolina's winning it all in 2017 and virginia's winning it all in 2019 there were some dudes on those teams right great Absolutely. coaches but some dudes 
NBA caliber dudes, college All-American caliber dudes, dudes. It starts with dudes. It continues with great coaches. And, you know, it's it's up to these ACC coaches, the new wave, to manage the portal well, continue to get prep All-Americans coming out of high school, and then keep and cultivate and develop the guys who want to stay. If you do that enough, it doesn't matter if you get your your college stars. It doesn't matter where you get them nowadays. It doesn't matter if, if it's the McDonald's All-American guys or if it's the latest transfer superstar. It doesn't matter. Look at Miami, three of their four best players, right? Our transfer guys. Uh, it's about accumulating, developing, and coaching talent. And we just have to get used to those new ways. As long as this this era of ACC coaches does those things well, I think you'll see the res- regular season resume bounce back from what it has been. And I think you'll see the NCAA tournament resume basically continue to be successful because it was really good at the end of last decade. Of course, no tournament in 2020. And it's been pretty good too. Very good last year, fairly good this year, not good in 2021. So that's one great year, one poor year, one better than average year. That's not a bad track record. Again, because March Madness to me matters more than the regular season does. Uh, I, I totally agree. Um, Virginia finds itself in a very odd situation right now, Dave. Uh, I don't ever, I can't ever recall anything quite like this. They, uh, as of this very moment, they don't have any returning starters coming back. Uh, We're not sure what Armand Franklin is going to do. We've heard various things about him that he feels like it might be time to go and Yet, uh, you know, where, where is he going to go? Uh, the only three guys on the roster, really, uh, Isaac McNeely, Ryan Dunn, both freshmen, and Tane Murray from uh, New Zealand, uh, who I don't think is going anywhere, uh, are the only three returning guys. They they lose the other starters and another couple other guys that uh, have either transferred out, graduated, or declared for the NBA, as in Reese Bigman did yesterday if you're sitting in the coaching office at jpj what what's going through your head right now well one thing i would say and of course when it comes to virginia basketball i defer to you on all (laughs) things always (laughs) i don't make too many superlative statements like that but you're a hall of famer for a lot of good reasons so I'll, I'll give my two cents, but I, I'm all ears on your two cents as well, or 10 cents or 100 cents in your case. Um, you know, and Tony's a smart guy, obviously. Tony Bennett, uh, I like and admire as much as anybody I've ever encountered in college sports. And that's not an ex- I'm not saying that just because I'm on your show. I think you know me well enough to know I'm saying that from the heart. I, I love the guy as a human yeah. being, and I respect him as a coach. So he understands it's probably against his nature a little bit. He's a relate. He's a, he's a, he's a human being before he's anything else, before he's a basketball coach, before he's a podcast subject, before he's anything. And there's probably a part of him that's bothered by the idea that somebody that he spent all that time recruiting and talking to their mom and dad and comes to his campus. And then they want to leave after a year when I leave. I'm sure he, as a human being, he he's processing that in some way. The coach in him is so smart that he's going to adapt. And I, I use the joke that every staff should now have somebody whose nickname is coach portal. <laughs> like when, when you, instead, instead of using their actual last name, you know, coach portal, you have to think in those terms. You you have to. The reason I would suggest that, of course, no no UVA coach is going to reach for the panic button. But the reason that I would advise the many passionate and knowledgeable UVA fans that I know personally not to reach for the panic button is that Duke, one year ago at this moment, so 12 months ago if we were having this conversation, do you know how many returning players – who I'll just say we're going to factor into the rotation Duke had under a brand new, never before head coach, John Shire. The answer was one. Yeah. Roach. It was Jeremy Roach. I mean, they did. Jalen Blakes was a scholarship player. So you could technically say they had two returning scholarship players, but everybody knew Blakes was not going to play a lot. 
given the freshmen coming in and some transfers coming in. So it's essentially you returned one key dude. You really returned one key scholarship player in a sport with 13 scholarships. Uh, with a new head coach, John Shire is a sharp young guy, but that's a lot of that's a lot of moving parts. Yeah. Now, not every team has the benefit of Kyle Filipowski and other, you know, on their way to the NBA freshman. You know, Ryan Young was a good transfer for the Blue Devils. I'm not saying it's easy, but Duke went from that one reliable scholarship player 12 months ago to the ACC championship, right? 12 months later. Exactly. And I know they, they exited a little bit early from the NCAA tournament, but still a lot more good than bad for Duke. If you look at their body of work under those extreme circumstances, and that's what they are. It's extreme. It's extreme to look at your roster and see only three returning guys. <laughs> right. But you know, as long as you're managing the portal, as long as you have some confidence in your incoming freshmen, I think you're going to be okay. But as you and I have this conversation right now, do I think Virginia would be somewhere in my top four? If we were, if we, no, a year ago they were, and I put them in my right. top four because right. I knew what they had back. Some people said, oh, it was only an NIT team. I said, well, yeah, wouldn't you like to have those five guys back from that NIT team? I would. So they, they were picked to be by most to be among the best teams in the ACC under a different set of circumstances, Nobody wants to go to the NIT and they lived up to those expectations by sharing first place and doing other very good things. Um, Tony will figure it out, you know, in, in Tony, we trust should be somewhere <laughs> on a banner for UVA fans. Um, but I understand the indigestion. And if, if those decisions you mentioned, if Beekman does leave for the NBA, and Franklin does turn the page and move on to whatever is next, maybe overseas career. That's that's a little bit more of a rebuild unless you scurry and add some big time players from the transfer portal. Yeah, and uh, I, I know that as soon as the portal opened, they were reaching out to at least uh, twenty players. So, and I'm sure they had heads up on some of these guys leaving, and they were. Because we kept wondering, why are they why are they looking for a point guard? <laughs> right. But hey, uh, look at it this way: yeah. Miami, Miami did not even know twelve months ago. Miami did not even know that they would have Nigel Pack, who turned out to be a star at guard, and nor, nor Chad O'Meara, who turned out to be um, all ACC player and their star in the post. Um, so two of their four best players twelve months ago, they didn't even know they were going to have. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's no reason um, that you can't make it work for you, even though uh, a lot of people thinks it works against you. But uh, uh, you can go in there and make your team stronger than it ever was before. You, you can. It's it's possible. Make sure you have, have a des designate a coach portal, man. It, it's <laughs> it's no fun. I I mean I I like the traditional aspect, the historical aspect of basketball. I do. It's not fun to wonder, you know, who's going to transfer from this league or that league. Um, some dudes, you already know they're good. You know, Norchad O'Meara was the Sun Belt player of the year, right? I know it's the Sun Belt, which is a mid-major, but he was the player of the year and the defensive player of the year. You're not exactly rolling the dice. Exactly. So some the, the transfer portal is filled with guys who weren't very good at their last school. You know, a lot of guys are leaving because they didn't get enough playing time at their last school. But there's a whole subsection of transfers nowadays that they were really good at their last school. You remember Jake LaRavia at Wake Forest a year ago? He he was first team all ICC, if I remember correctly. He was really, really good at his previous school. Um, so sometimes you know guys are good, and it's it's just a different version of recruiting those high school superstars that you know are good. And, and in some cases with freshmen, you know they can help you right away. In more cases with the elite transfers, you know they can help you right away because some of these guys are 20, 21, 22 years old, and you don't have to wait for the growth curve that you do with most incoming freshmen. Yeah. And Virginia's had some good success with the portal too. So uh, it hasn't been all bad or all one way. So um, I, I would uh, – encourage Virginia fans, like you said, Dave, not to panic. 
could end up being stronger, stronger than ever. So, and my dog, Jaden Gardner, dog right? Jaden Gardner <laughs> and Armand Franklin turned out pretty well, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Well, listen, uh, Dave, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us and sharing your knowledge and insight. We always uh, enjoy what you have to say about the ACC and uh, it's always fun spending time with you, man. I appreciate you carving out a little time for us. Right back at you. I enjoy our visits always. Uh, congratulations on your Hall of Fame and other well-deserved honors. I know you're a humble guy, so I'm purposely trying to embarrass you by reminding you of that repeatedly, uh, but it's well-deserved. I have the utmost respect for you. I have a lot of fun every time we see each other or chat. So keep up the good work with your podcast and your other work. Uh, and call me anytime. Uh, and no matter no matter where my career is, uh, I will join you at your discretion. So uh, thanks to, for having me and best wishes to you and your listeners. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You got it, man. Take care. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do a little commercial work and then uh, send this off to my uh, producer to figure it out. <laughs> Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Always good to chat with you. Thank you. Same here. And, uh, uh sad I don't won't see you again probably until uh yeah I, i've got some crazy career stuff going on so i i'll keep you in the loop but uh yeah. there, there's some options that would bring me more into sports media full time there's some other options where i might teach full time there's some other options where i might do law full time so as i sit here chatting with you i'm not sure if i'm going to be kind of a regular on the acc beat the way i was for 30 years or i'm going to it's it's a weird time in my life it's exciting but it's unpredictable um so we'll see but odds odds are odds are i'll stay in it it's just whether i stay in it on the smaller level or whether i really dive back in on a deeper level so we'll see i'll keep you in the loop okay it's nice to have options yeah it is thank you <laughs> all right, all right man keep up the good work have a great weekend thank you you too all right thanks And we'd like to thank our sponsors for um, allowing us to come to you uh, a few times a week uh, with various great guests from all over the ACC and the country and UVA. And uh, we'd like to thank the Good Feet store over at Stonefield. We'll talk more about them in a moment. Uh, Roback. Uh, got all my Roback uh hoodie here with the great logo that they have on their clothing. Uh, one of America's fastest growing sports wear, active wear companies, uh, great clothing, comfortable, attractive. Um, it's a big hit. Uh, it's a, they're all over the place. Uh, somebody told me they uh, saw some over in, Cal in California uh, the other day. So uh, this this company's going <laughs> growing like wildfire uh click on their ad on my website and you can take a glimpse at their catalog and uh they are an nil sponsor of uh key clark as is the good feet store we'll again we'll talk about them in a minute uh call up roback on our, our site and uh, uh when you're ready to order click on the uh, code Jerry, J-E-R-R-Y, and get a generous 20% discount on your order, which uh, can't beat that. Also, uh, thank you to the Aberdeen Barn, Virginia's greatest steakhouse. Uh, scrumptious food, great atmosphere, can't beat it. You never know what wahoo you might run into while you're there. The, it's been a, a, a historic place in terms of Virginia Athletics all these years with uh, all the greats dine there and uh, relax there with uh, just, uh, like I said, an incredible atmosphere. You can watch your favorite games and relax and uh, enjoy friends. And uh, so drop by and see Angela and Terry at the barn. You can't make a mistake there. It's uh, fine dining. And uh, getting back to the Good Feet people, the Good Feet store, uh, they have a special event going on Saturday. 
um, right before the final four. Um, I think some of it might actually stretch into the final four, but beginning at 4.30 Saturday at their store in Stonefield, 4.30 to 6.30, uh, Virginia's Kihei Clark and Jaden Gardner uh, will be there to say farewell to Virginia fans. Um, drop by and see them. You can pose for photographs, get an autograph poster, and just uh, wish them well on whatever their next endeavors are going to be and uh, talk some hoops. So uh, I think there's, there'll be some good food there. And uh, Jonathan Cotton, the great host and owner of uh, the Good Feet Store, will be there. Um, so uh, and uh, while you're there, take time to look at their product because uh, I know so many people that have uh, bought the arches uh, to help their feet and uh, they've resolved all their walking and running problems, um, taking away a lot of the pain and discomfort that they've had. So, uh, and I'm one of them. So uh, I can testify that it truly works. So go by the Good Feet store tomorrow between 4.30 and 6.30 at Stonefield. And again, say goodbye to Kihei Clark and Jaden Gardner for all their Great work at UVA over the past few years. And uh, that's it for today. Uh, thank you for listening, and we'll be back next week with a couple more podcasts for your listening pleasure. Thank you.